Good evening. Welcome to the Danvers Conservation Commission meeting for uh, November the 12th, 2020. We operate under the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Wetlands Protection Act, and Chapter 26 of the Town of Danvers General Bylaw, the Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Uh, after the applicant presents his or her request and the board has had time to ask questions and discuss the project, we'll accept questions from the audience. Because this is a public meeting, it is required by law that you give your name and address before you speak. Although we may disagree on the issues raised, all persons present during this meeting are expected to be civil to all other meeting attendees. This includes members of the commission, staff, abutters, concerned citizens, and property owners and project applicants. That being said, I'm gonna go ahead and call roll call. Uh, uh, Peter Wilson, present. Vanessa Curran. I don't see her yet. We'll hopefully she'll um, join Vanessa us. Vanessa emailed. She's um, joining. It's just going slow, but she will be here. Okay. Well, we see. We'll just say that she's here. Uh, Michael Splain. Present. Ann McGill. Here. Chelsea King. Here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond that you are here. Uh, Georgia Pendergast. Here. David Fields. Present. Alicia Linehan. Here. Anticipated speakers on the agenda. Please respond that you are here. Um, representing uh, 41 North Belgian Street, Bill Manuel. Bill, you muted. I can't hear him. Bill Manuel, are you here? I'll go back to Billy, still muted. Um, for 23 Congress Street, Bob Griffin. Uh, I'm here, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can, and Great, Ryan thanks. Livermore. Uh, I'm here as well, yes. Okay. Uh, I will go, I have to go back to Bill because he's gonna be first on the agenda. I don't think you caught muting. You, you called Bill, uh, this is Sandra Delgado. I'm the, one, the owner of 41 North Belgian Road. Right, okay, hi Sandra. Hi. Um, Good evening, everybody. Okay, if anyone uh, can get a hold of Bill, just tell him to unmute him so we can say that he's here. Um, okay, just a little introduction. Uh, good evening. The opening meeting of the Danvers Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to, to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted on the town's website allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is not This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Conservation Commission as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting materials. Supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and will be shown during this transmission. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. We now turn Before we do so, permit me to cover some of the ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conduct their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. 
For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Just please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourselves. For items with public comment, we have established an email address for public comment, which is publiccommons at danversmass.gov. This email address is shown online with the streaming of this meeting. Residents may email comments and they will be provided or slash read out loud after staff has confirmed their name and address. All emails must contain the date and the phrase Conservation Commission in the subject line. We have also established a phone line for public comment. You may call 978-777-0001, extension 2, to provide comment. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Moving to our agenda. Uh, first item is continued hearing on a violation at 55 Wenham Street. This item has been continued to our December the 10th meeting. Uh, second is a continued public hearing, uh, an RDA, an RDA, an RDA for 188 Elliott Street. Um, this has been continued to December 10th. Next up is a continued public hearing for an NOI for 41 North Belgian Way, DEP file number 14-1350. Uh, the applicant is Sandra Delgado, uh, and who is here to represent uh, Sandra? Bill Manuel, Willie Manuel is supposed to be on the line. Uh, before we get to Bill, Bill, you're, you're muted, so you're gonna have to unmute. Uh, I noticed that Vanessa is here, so let's just note that she is attending. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Um, I am having trouble. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there's an echo. Bill, you must have your phone. There Can you, go. you hear Let's me now? Go. Yes. Yeah. I can't hear you. That's my problem. Um, let me dial back in and uh, I'll just have to use the phone. Will he still be able to present his materials, Georgia? He should be. Um, if not, I can pull up the new plan on the screen. We'll give him a minute. Uh, can people hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, you can hear me, but I can't hear anything from you. So, uh, but anyway, this is Bill Manuel speaking regarding 41 North Belgian Way. And I want to thank the commission members, those of you who were able to make it out for the site walk. Uh, what you saw was the backyard is fairly small, and um, and many of you expressed that um, you saw you got a, a more clear picture of what was being proposed as a result of the site walk. Um, I would like to share my screen, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, Bill, you, you have that power. Okay, I have the power. So we did submit a revised plan and uh, the, the highlights of that revised plan were um, this, the pool got smaller. And uh, can everybody see this, this plan in, on the screen? Could you zoom it just a little bit, Bill, so we could see the, um, the different lines? Is that better for you? Y yes, it is, it's perfect. All right, perfect. Okay, so we did submit a revised plan. The pool got smaller. It was initially a uh, 12 by 36, and now it's a 12 by 24 pool. 
The original plan did not have a little steps coming up to the pool deck. So we added that onto this plan. Um, you had asked about how we we're going to deal with runoff from the patio. And so we did add a uh, infiltration trench along the outer edge of the patio. Of course, everything's gonna be sloped away from the house and the addition. So it will all flow into this infiltration trench. It's a small area, so that should uh, accommodate the runoff from the patio just fine. And then we uh, we talked about the removal of these overgrown shrubs and what would happen with the stumps. And uh, we agreed that we would grind the stumps out of the ground. They would not be excavated or pulled out of the ground. So we would grind these stumps uh, after the shrubs were cut down. Uh, those are the, uh, that, that's the highlights, but most importantly from the site walk, uh, I think all the commission members that were there expressed that they, they weren't aware that there was this wide space of natural vegetation that's still on the property, but behind the fence, the existing fence and the fence that's going to be proposed. And that seemed to uh, uh, make the difference in, in in the proposal versus what, what the commission was suggesting at the last meeting. You notice we, we did not move, attempt to move the pool out of the no disturb zone in this iteration. And I, I illustrated what would happen if on site, what would happen if we moved the pool, tried to get it completely out of this no disturb zone and it would move it by about six feet, but the edge of the pool would be directly against this patio here. And given that this area was all lawn anyway, it didn't seem to make sense to just unnecessarily jam that pool up against the new patio. And, and also the same thing with the shed, we had proposed to move it so that it matched up directly adjacent to the shed on the abutting land. Uh, this area was, uh, sort of dirt and grass anyway. So there was no vegetation that would be required to move the shed there. And the, those that were on the site expressed uh, that, that that seemed to be acceptable to them. Uh, we looked at, you know, we talked about other places, but the backyard is just so small that, and, and this is a 10 scale plan. So it's not like there's a whole lot of room here, but the backyard was just so small that uh, you just, there wasn't any other space for that shed. And the shed was needed because I explained the house is on a slab. It has no basement and no garage. So therefore they really needed something to store that patio furniture that was out in the, in the yard. So uh, I think the, the, uh, the changes are for the, to the plan. Um, the smaller pool, I think helped a lot. And you know, these just the, the addition of this, this uh, filter strip here to catch the, the patio runoff and clarifying that these stumps will be ground out. I think that'll go a long way and give a comfort level to the commission to allow the waivers that we've requested. And the allowance would only be for this particular site and these particular conditions, because unlike a lot of the other homes that are in the Woodvale subdivision, this had its own sort of natural vegetation strip that would be left over um, and, and untouched as a result of any of this work. So uh, because of that reason, I think the waivers are justified and we hope that you see it that way as well. Thank you. All set, All set Bill? Yes, I am. Okay, um, I'll start off with my comments and questions first. Uh, I'm kind of torn whether to grant this waiver or not, but I'm kind of leaning towards uh, granting one, uh, mostly because I see the the other houses in the neighborhood all seem to have pools uh, within the, uh, the no disturb zone. Um, that being said, um, I think our biggest concern with the intermittent stream uh, that we're dealing with here is erosion. Um, and as such, uh, I mean, we, we did make uh, one arrangement where the stumps would be ground uh, instead of being ripped out. Uh, but I also know that you wanna build a fence along the back edge. So uh, 
to build that fence, you're going to have to um, dig for posts. So uh, in that regard, we need to have pretty strong erosion control that none of that um, the, the soils coming out of those post holes finds its way into the um, into the intermittent stream. Uh, and the third thing that I would think is uh, when water is drawn off in the fall as the pool is closed, I would like to see that water go out to the street into a storm drain. Um, other than that, um, I don't really see any detrimental effects to the wetlands. So uh, I think all in all, you know, you, you might be good to go, in my opinion. Um, that being said, I'm going to turn it over to the members and uh, see what they might have for comments or questions, and then we'll we'll go from there. So the first I'll ask is Mike. Mike, you're going to have to unmute. All right, can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. But I don't think. Why is that echo? Are you picking up an echo? Mike, I think you're signed in twice on your browser, so we see you twice on here. Well, what if I close out? If wow. you lose me, just skip over and I'll come back. So I closed okay. out one of those, okay? Let me see. All right. You still hear us, Mike? You have to unmute again, though, Mike. I think I'm there back. we go. I'm back. Go. Good. All right. You know, um, I I just I disagree with the chair on on the point that well because other people have done it we should allow it in this case. Um, I just don't like the idea of the pool being in the you no know, disturb. We talked about it and they, we talked previously about moving the shed to a different location where I think where the bushes were. So. Uh, I'm not really in favor of, uh, especially where we're now extending the no build, no disturbs, and uh, we're still granting waivers for the 25, and, we're, and at the same time, we're, we're pushing it out to 35, so I'm not in favor. That's all. Okay. Um, Anne. Um Having been on site, one of the things that uh, we noticed right away is that moving the shed to the side, as we originally thought, was completely out of the, there's no room there. There's really no room there. So that was the, the thing, seeing how small that yard is. Secondly, um, you were right about the, the land beyond the fence. Um, there's, I don't know if it's two or three feet wide there, um, so that there, so there would be no runoff going down to the in, intermittent stream. Unlike if you looked across, you saw where people had fences and it was immediately slanted down into the stream. This is not the case here. It's very flat. Um, so removing the, the ugly little trees there and replacing them with some um, native plants uh, will make a difference, I think, in terms of containing anything from the yard. So after seeing the location um, and the, where the shed is put, there's plenty of space over there. There's a tree uh, it's near it, but there's plenty of room next to it. Whether or not they can put it there, they, they do have to get some um, permission there based on what I read earlier. So it may be closer um, away from that um, corner. Um, and still, if that's the case, there's there's room there to do that too. So I look at the proposed and the fact that the pool is smaller favorably. Okay, that's it. I'll say it in. Uh, did we lose Vanessa? No, I'm here. All right, uh, Vanessa, why don't you go ahead? Then I'll uh, we'll get to Chelsea last. Okay. Um, I just wanted to kind of clarify for Mike's benefit because he wasn't at the site visit that I feel like the options here are the pool where they where it's proposed or no pool at all because there really is just not any option to move it. Um, it's 
the yard, it's misleading on this plan. The yard looks a lot bigger on the plan than it is in reality. And so just for Mike's benefit, I think there is no option C of put it in a different place. Um, can, can everybody mute it? There's like a lot of background noise that I'm hearing. Thanks. Um, pertaining to the shed, I don't have a problem with it being in that corner of the yard, but I do think I would like to see it moved a few feet forward. It's just really right at the fence line. And um, I did, you know, kind of looking along the various backyards, there were others that were moved a little further forward. And I think it's just better to have it not so close um, to where eventually the slope breaks. Um, just if we could even put like five, three to five feet behind it just to move it that much further away from the fence line and from where eventually the slope does start to um, drop off. I think it, I would like to see that moved a little bit further forward. Um, I have kind of mixed feelings on this because I, I, I hear what Mike's saying, but I also hear what the chair is saying. So. I think I'm still kind of turning it over in my mind, but I'm still thinking about it a little bit. I, I, I don't see that it can be moved out. It's either there or it doesn't exist. Those are the options from my point of view. Can I have, can I have further comment on that, Peter? Um, if if like uh, like Bill like Mann, for you. Yeah, um, let, me just, let me just get to Chelsea, then we'll come back to you. Chelsea, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, so it, I wasn't able to attend the site visit either. And like, if it's that drastically different in person from what I'm seeing on the, uh, on the plan, I yeah, it seems like we are in that situation of like either the pool doesn't exist or it goes where the where it is on the plan because I really don't think it can be moved, which is kind of bothersome because it's right on the 25 foot no disturb. And I agree with Mike. I'm not thrilled with it being there. Um. But where else could it go? Um, if it does go in, I would want some like very, very clear conditions about like no runoff, like it all has to go into the street, um, and lots of like nice native evergreen shrubs going in that area. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of this is a tricky one. I'm not sure where I stand on it. So yeah, that's all I have to say. And I agree with both Georgia, I mean, sorry, with Chelsea and Vanessa, in that I've gone back and forth over this for the last two or three days. It just, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Okay, are you all set, uh, Chelsea? Yeah, I am. Okay, uh, Mike? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, you know, it was unfortunate. I had, I wanted to go there, but then I, I think I told Georgia I had uh, got tested for coronavirus, so I thought for a few until I, I wouldn't go anywhere. And as it turned out, I was fine. But you know, you don't take chances. So, in any case, um, if Bill's there, I, I'd like to uh, ask Bill Manuel some questions. Go right ahead, Mike. Yeah, are you there, Bill? Yes, I am. Thanks, Bill. With regards to the um, the uh, the drawing we're looking at now. Is the patio existing now? There is a sort of a makeshift patio, more or less in that location. It's uh, it, it's some uh, sort of wood framing with uh, plywood decking on it. It's, it's certainly a temporary feature, but for those that were there, it was kind of exhibit A about, you know, what the patio, where it would be and, and kind of the size it would be. Yeah, but so the patio is what's the driving where the pool is because the, the design of the patio, um, you're saying you can't move the pool to a little bump into the patio, but does the patio, you have a little, I see you have a little, a little uh, 90 degree indent on the, the um, top of the patio. What if that went right across? Wouldn't you then be able to take the pool out of the no disturb? Well, 
the whole point of this pool discussion, uh, respectfully, is it's all grass, and it, it doesn't really make a difference if it's in grass in the present location or grass in a, a new location. It's all maintained lawn. And the point I was uh, trying to stress at the site walk was, yeah, you can move it and you could jam everything up close to the house. And I mean, it, it's gonna be a nice house with the additions. It's not extravagant. They're not going up and having multiple stories. Sandra's not going up and, and having a big house. It's just a modest addition on a, on a frankly, a, a modest size home. And if we jam everything up the way you're suggesting, then it, it just unnecessarily makes it a bad design when it, we're talking grass in one location versus grass in another location. Um, Mr. Chair, can I say something to that? <laughs> Uh, let's just let Mike finish his questions, Chelsea, and then we'll okay. go. Yep. I was just thinking I had almost the same setup, but we actually walked out the back door onto a deck and opened the gate onto the pool, which did back actually back right up like you're talking about, and it actually worked out fine. But, you know, it's a matter of taste, I guess, too. So... Um, uh, the other... The other... Were you, you there, Bill? Is it a pool? It's an above ground. Yeah, I had the same thing, same setup. <laughs> the um, I noticed in uh, the staff comments uh, that uh, they were concerned about the flow uh, causing erosion issues uh, because of the steep banks, and then adding structures close up to the top of the bank would increase the rate of erosion. So that was another concern. Would you address that? Yes. Uh, this is an above ground pool. I want to stress that. So it, it's not as easy as you know opening a gate and walking out to a patio. This this feature is is uh, 54 inches tall. So you know the closer you move it to the patio, it's like creating an artificial wall and, and basically blocking access to the rear yard. Uh, but what respect to the uh, installation of the pool, this being above ground, really the only thing you need to do is scrape off the grass, the scrape off the loam, and then they put this layer of, of bedding sand uh, down in the pool footprint, and, and then, you know, the pool comes in, in several boxes, and it basically gets installed in one day. Uh, so there's no extensive uh, excavation or anything like that. And with respect to you know seasonal drawdown, what we need to do for that, we're fine with you know piping it out towards the street. I, I doubt they'll pipe it all the way to the street because basically they just need say 50 feet of, of hose. But they could certainly you know direct it around either side of the house so that it doesn't go in the direction of the intermittent stream. I'll point out no, that the I'll, backyard is almost. Let me stop you, Bill. What are other yes. people doing? I mean, you're going to be dumping five to 10,000 gallons out into the street or into a drain, or are you going to have someone come and pump the water out? No, it, you only draw it down a short yeah. ways from the I know, below the free, get below the skim. Yeah, and, and this is a small pool. It's not like a, you know, a large in-ground pool with 30,000 gallons. This is a small above-ground pool. It's just not going to be that much water. And, and basically you have a, what's a pool pump. So it's like a horsepower pump. It's just not going to generate, you know, like a fire hose velocity, it's just going to, you know, discharge the water. It's going to go on the grass and uh, <clears throat> it'll, it'll just disperse over the grass surface. And it, it, I I, um, I think I agree with uh, Vanessa's comments about the shed being right up against the fence, and that's really close to the bank. Could yeah, we put a number on that? How far? I see. 
Yeah, the reason it is where it is is because there is a neighboring shed directly to the right oh, of no, it. And everybody's you know, saying that's what they're saying. Well, because the pool uh, next door is in the 25, we should be. Because the shed's where the neighbor has it, we should have it. But that's not how we're supposed to judge this stuff. I understand that, but I am asking you to look at th this particular set of circumstances, and in here, you know, you want to you can you want to pick it up and move it all around the backyard. But at the end of the day, it's all grass. It makes no difference if if we had one location, and it were we had to cut down trees and vegetation in the 25 foot no disturb zone. I'd say you know you have a valid point, but. If you want to move it six feet, and at the end of moving it six feet, it's just grass. I, I don't, frankly, I don't see the point in that. This is a, a case where you could consider a waiver. Are these two separate waivers, Georgia? So I believe he pied for both. Um, I can't see the 35 on here, but it was for the shed in the 25, the pool in the 25, um, and a portion of the stairs in the pool in the 35. <clears throat> Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, okay, Chelsea, you had like, a few more questions? Um, I just wanted to say, like, in response to the fact that the lawn is all grass, it's already developed. Um, normally, I've, like, been lenient with cases like that but because we've had so many uh projects lately where we've referred to previous projects to make more leniency and like we've set precedent for certain things i'm kind of hesitating to set a precedent for building a pool right on the 25 foot no disturb zone like even if it is just grass right now it's like i don't want to approve this and then you know in the proposes a similar project and says like well you've approved something like this in the past so we should be allowed to do that um yeah i'm just i'm i'm growing more consistent. so that's all uh chelsea uh mr chairman can i respond to chelsea certainly it, uh, this doesn't set a precedent for any other site in danvers this particular site has its own unique circumstances and in this case, as the people that went on the site visit saw, this area here was naturally vegetated, unlike other lots that are in the, you know, the Woodville subdivision that, that tend to right after the, the back fence, they drop down almost like a cliff. This had a nice gradual slope that was naturally vegetated, and none of that vegetation is being disturbed at all. There will be additional native evergreens installed along the the house side of the fence here. So we're actually enhancing that, that buffer. So if you consider that this is almost a dead flat backyard, it has an undisturbed naturally vegetated strip, and this is an above ground pool with minimal site preparation needed, I think those facts relevant to this particular site are what you could, should consider and not how someone else might interpret it for their particular project. Okay, Chelsea, anything else? No, that was it. All right, uh, Bill and uh, Sandra, it, it, it looks uh, it, like it's, it's close. Uh, you want to reconsider it? Do you want to take your chances on the plan as proposed? Uh, Sandra, are you on here this evening? I think she may have been muted. So Sandra, if you want to try to unmute. Sandra, are you on this evening? She was there earlier, Bill, because uh, she, I heard her say she was here. Hello? 
Hello. Hi, Sandra. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, um, the only thing that I wanted to add to what Bill Emanuel was saying is that, um, and I'd like for you to seriously consider this. I mean, I know that you have your um, reservations with respect to any damage to the property, to the con to the land, but um, the whole, my whole entire house is on conservation land. And I would hope that the conservation board would consider that this is, that there's no area in my pro on my property that is not conservation land. And that I would think, I would hope that uh, you would consider part of the work and the things that I want to add to my property as a hardship because, because of the fact that I have no land on my space, on my land that is not conservation. So, I mean, I, I would hope that because that you would consider part of this as a hardship and you may not think that a pool or moving the shed to a particular area in the, on the property is a hardship, but when you have a small space like I do and I'm trying to utilize it in the most appropriate way so that it, it preserves the land as well as me getting what I want out of my property that you could consider that as well. Um, when the when the three board members that went through the property, they saw that what was what is being proposed to this property is made sense. And that's what I guess most most of the people, most of the out of the, the three that were there said it made sense, although one had a slight, you know, is still on the fence about which way to go with respect to the pool and, and perhaps the shed. Um, I wouldn't mind moving the shed just a bit, but I'd like to really respectfully ask the, the board to um, really consider that the property is not being damaged, that it's being preserved um, in the most natural state that it, that it is and that it will continue to be. And that, um, you know, one was suggested to, to pull the, the pool closer to the house and, you know, you walk right into, you know, you put a fence. Um, as that person said, you know, it's a matter of taste. Uh, I don't want to walk right into a pool and have, you know, open up the fence to get into that area. It, it would be as the pool, the, the, the yard is already small enough that I don't want to walk right into something like that. Um, you know, I do have children, I have a dog. And so the way everything is laid out is, so that the family can enjoy the property without making any disturbances or anything that would uh, you know, cause any unnecessary harm to the property uh, or to the land. Um, so I'd like that for you to all consider that. And, and again, as I said, this is a hardship because no area on my property is not conservation land. So I don't have um, the ability to, to do anything else um, with the space that I have. And that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Uh, yeah. Bill, one more quick question as I'm looking at the drawing. Um, what is the, the blue line at the top of the drawing? Is that the, the, uh, the um, edge of the... Bill, you're muted. We had to mute you because we were going to. There you go. Yep. Um, so this is the the bank resource area. This blue line. This is the 25 no disturb. This is the 35 no build, and this is the 100 foot buffer zone line. Okay. Now, where is the fence on the back of the property? What I'm driving at, Bill, is I think your your erosion control in the back is not going to be sufficient for the, uh, the post holes for the fence. Uh, well, he, the yellow line is where we have the erosion control. And the fence posts are going to be dug with a post hole digger. So uh, really, they, they're dug. The posts are set. Usually, they throw some concrete in there. And then whatever isn't put back in the hole is just you know, taken away. So I, I don't know that we really need erosion control. I'd like erosion control there, Bill. I mean, we all well, know when you, when you dig a hole that all the dirt 
just doesn't always go where you want it. It's going to, you know, it rains or someone kicks it or whatever. We want to keep everything out of that uh, drainage area. That would be fine. That's that's not a, a huge adjustment. Okay. Uh, okay, are there any uh, comments from the public? Uh, let me ask uh, Dave first. Are there any emails? We can get back to Dave, but I haven't seen any emails. So I think we're all uh, okay, are there any phone calls, Alicia? There are no phone calls. Uh, is there anyone participating in the meeting that would like to comment? Yes, good evening. This is Matthew Duggan. Hello, I'm a member in Precinct 1. So I have some questions and comments uh, for three specific uh, areas. The first is the stream, the second is the shed, and then the third would be the pool water discharge. So with the stream, this uh, stream, this intermittent stream, the source comes from over on the other side of the rail trail on, uh, I think it was Brookwood Drive, right? This is not Fishbrook uh, that we're talking about, right? This is the uh, stream that comes uh, basically west to east. Is that something okay. you can add? Can you answer that or no? Uh, I'm not prepared to answer that. I don't know. Okay. Right, let me ask you about, and I ask it because Frost Fish Brook is uh, a multi-year, uh, there's a multi-year project to harden the banks uh, with uh, riprap. So are the, is the, are the banks of this stream that uh, at, at the top of the drawing, are the banks hardened? Uh, Mr. Duggan, this is Bill Manuel. Uh, normally we don't get involved in conversations between uh, the participants of the meeting, but um, you asked me. Well, well I, 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 yeah, I, this is a public hearing, sir. So I have the right to ask questions and make comments. Of course you do, and you, you, uh, but anyway, to answer your question about the stream, uh, it is a tributary to Frost Fish Brook, and uh, the banks are not hardened on this reach of, of Brook. Okay. All right, that's fine. All right, let's move on to the shed. So on the shed, on this new uh, layout, the shed is up here at the uh, upper uh, right-hand corner. So we talked about this at the last uh, 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 hearing. So. What is the setback between that purple line at the very top and the yellow line, which I think denotes where the new fence will be? How far is the shed from uh, the lot line at the top, at the rear lot line? Bill, you're gonna have to unmute each time because we, we get a lot of noise when you're not speaking and other people are. Um, there you go. It's, it's 10 feet. Okay, I think I heard you say 10 feet. So on uh, table two of the zoning bylaws, the table of dimensional requirements in uh, R2, the setback is 15 feet. So that is, uh, you would have to go to the ZBA to get a variance to be able to uh, move that shed closer to the property line, the, the rear setback. And then uh, finally on the pool water, I heard that uh, the chair mentioned that he did not want to see the pool water discharge uh, into that intermittent stream. So uh, then I heard uh, uh, an alternative uh, uh, method to get rid of the pool water, and that would be to pipe it out to the street. So in Danvers, uh, or actually in Massachusetts, it's illegal to discharge chlorinated pool water into a storm drain. So you would be forced to uh, maintain that, either treat the water and allow the chlorine to dissipate, or you would need to uh, just dump it onto the yard, onto your grass, which um, is really the alt only uh, choice I see here. And then uh, one last thing in closing, and just to, from a general comment that I've heard several times is that you know, this needs to be allowed because other properties in the area uh, 
have already have pools that are uh, sounds like they're in violation. So rather than make something more detrimental, uh, those other properties should also be uh, in investigated to see if they were built uh, under this type of uh, scrutiny. And uh, and also the applicant, I just heard the applicant say that this property is conservation land. That that's not true. This is not conservation land. The reason that we're discussing this project or this application is because of its potential impact to the wetlands, not the not the property itself, not the land that the building is on. It's about the wetlands, right? So the runoff into the stream that goes to Frostfish, Frost, Frostfish Brook and then down to the Porter River. And we know that the Porter River is in decline, um, that less fresh water is making it down into the Porter River and the brackish water is moving upstream and significantly alternate, uh, alterating alterating the uh, the bio uh, the biodiversity of the of the river. So these projects in in isolation look like they're minor things, but in totality they have a significant impact. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. All right, uh, Rick, I just want to make a couple comments, Matt. Uh, the first one on the um, allowing is because the neighbors have it. That is not forcing our hand, that is at our discretion. Uh, your second point is uh, the water will be unchlorinated because it has to stand for like two or three days and then the uh, the chlorine dissipates. So we're just discharging fresh water to the storm drains. The third is uh, we're trying to set conditions where no runoff from this particular project is making it into the stream because we don't want any erosion. Uh, and the fourth is, I think the homeowner said she was on conservation land. I think there's just a matter of semantics. I think is what she's saying is that her whole property lies in our jurisdiction, the hundred foot jurisdiction. Yeah, and I, I think I, I understood that, that. I think that's what she was trying to convey. So I just wanted to, for clarification for anyone uh, that may have been watching this from home or whatever to understand the, the differentiation between those two terms. All right, okay. thank you, sir. That being said, you're welcome. Uh, so, George, a uh, quick question. We lost her. Do we, uh, before I ask for motions, do we have to vote on two waivers, one for the 35 and one for the 25, or just one for the 25? Uh, both waivers, because there is, he is proposing structures within the 35. Okay, uh, and do we need to close the hearing first or after? Close hearing. Okay, so uh, I guess, uh, does anyone else have any comment before I move to, or I ask someone to move to close the hearing? I just, oh, is there somebody else? Um, I'll just go quickly. So just in terms of the shed, the reason I brought it up, um, just to touch on something Bill said earlier, it's, I agree that the place you have it located now is grass and moving it a few feet forward is also grass, but it's kind of for the same reason that we were um, very concerned about the idea of pulling out the stumps of the overgrown shrubs and instead wanting to grind them because we don't want anything to undermine the bank. It's kind of the highest point right there before it starts sloping off. Like on the back side of the fence, Although the slope isn't right on the back side of the fence, it's where it kind of gets started. So it's more so um, the weight and the structure kind of at the top near the break in the slope rather than it being on what it's on, like a grassy area. I agree that whole corner is grass. It's just bringing the weight of um, something fairly heavy further away from the, the break in the slope. And just to add to that, uh... Vanessa and Bill, uh, Matt made a good point on your, your setback requirements. Uh, that's something you have to be aware of before you go for a building permit. Um, and if you want to go, going to be wanting, going to want to be within the setback, uh, you know, you would have to go to the ZBA. All right, are there any other questions from the board, comments?
Okay, uh, someone's willing to make a motion that we close the hearing for um, 41 and North Belgium Road, please. I'll make a motion that we close the hearing for 41 North Belgian Road. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, okay, That's all in favor other. of closing the hearing for 41 North Belgian Way. Uh, for the members, Vanessa? Yes. Michael? Yes. Aye. Ann? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. And Peter? Yes. Okay, uh, next we will uh, vote to grant a waiver for some building of the, the deck or portions of the deck within the 35 um, no build zone. Is there a, a motion to uh, grant that waiver? I'll vote. I'll make the motion that we grant the waiver for building in the 35 foot zone for 41 North Belgium department file number 14 1350. Is the motion been made? Is there a second, please? I'll second. Okay, I'm going to pull the members. I uh, just vote yes or no whether we want to grant this waiver. Vanessa. Yes. Michael. No. Ann. Yes. Chelsea. Yes. And Peter. Yes. Okay, so we grant the waiver for the 35. Uh, now we need to uh, vote on a waiver to allow uh, this pool and the shed to be uh, located within the 25 no disturb zone. Uh, could I have a motion uh, along those lines, please? Yeah. I'll make the motion that we grant a waiver for the work within the 25 foot zone for 41 North Belgium department file number 14 1350. Uh, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, all in favor? Vanessa? Yes. Michael? No. Ann? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Peter? Yes. Okay, now we are, uh, final vote on this is to grant a order of conditions uh, for 41 North Belgian Way, DEP vial number 14-1350. And... Um, Whoever makes the motion, uh, we will probably suggest uh, conditions that go along with it. So just if someone makes that motion, I won't, won't go from there. I'll make a motion to issue an order of conditions for 41 North Belgian, DP file number 14-1350. The conditions that I think we've mentioned so far is um, putting the erosion control behind where the fence is going to be installed rather than in front. Um, I'd personally like to see the shed move forward. Um, it seems like it might need to be done so anyways to comply with zoning setbacks, but I think it just needs to be a little bit further away from the break in the slope. And were there any other additional conditions? Uh, to um, have the pool water discharged? Yes, non-chlorinated pool water discharged. To the front of the house? Yes, away from the resource area. Uh, okay, uh, Georgia, just a quick question. Are there any other conditions that we're missing? Um, I had those, but I also wanted to clarify um, if you want to just condition that staff could make the determination if the shed is placed appropriately far enough away from that break in the bank. Just it's hard to put in the order, move it away from the break and not having like an appropriate number. So if that's something the commission's comfortable with me, determining in the field with the applicant, I'm happy to do that. I'm comfortable with that. Can I ask a question on that? Is how can we vote to, to have the shed uh, closer than what the zoning allows without them first going for relief for the zoning? Um, I well, don't see it. I mean, I think either the shed should be pulled back at least 
to where it's legal, um, then well, trying I to uh, then I go ahead. I would say the commission could approve the plan as it is, but ultimately it's up to the building inspector to issue that that permit for that. And if it's not according to where it should be, he's going to require it to go somewhere else. But in that now saying that, Mike, if it does need to be moved, that's that would be the appropriate place if it's further from the break. You comfortable with that, Mike? Well, I mean, at least the, the person making the motion has suggested it be moved. Or, I mean, maybe the suggestion would be that it be moved five more feet so that they, they don't have to go to the zoning board of appeals because I think one of the things we had that, that meeting at the, the junior high school was to say that there was more interaction between the various boards. And uh, I, I noticed in one of the matters we have tonight was where a building permit was issued for work, uh, which would not have been allowed by the Conservation Commission right. Right. and it's a uh, communication issue. So why are we allowing a shed 10 feet away when we know zoning requires it to be 15 feet away? Uh, Mr. Chair? So, go ahead, David. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, Mr. Splain, uh, just to be clear, the shed, I, I'm not sure exactly what size the shed is. Mm -hmm. um, guessing it's fairly small, but if it's less than 10 by 12 or 120 square feet, we uh, the zoning in town allows it to be closer to the lot line than otherwise accessory structures or buildings would be. So I think the rule is that, by rule, I mean it's in the bylaw, but the zoning, the building inspector has a, um, sheet that he has online. I think if it's less than 120 square feet and less than 10 feet tall, it can be closer to the lot line. I think up to five feet, don't quote me on that. So they may be okay with the shed, but your your point's well taken in that if the shed needs to be moved, it needs to comply with zoning. But I think in this case, they might be okay. Yeah. Does Bill Manuel know is it is 120 square feet or less, Bill? I have it right here if you want me to read it, or if you're clarifying what the shed is. Uh, the shed is 96 square feet. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, Vanessa, just, just a suggestion on your uh, motion. That we just say that the uh, the shed is uh, moved to uh, within the, the limits of zoning. We, we leave oh. it at that. Okay, so, but I think based on what David just said, that if it is under 120 square feet and it's okay where it is, I still want it further away. Okay, then just just give us a number then. Um, I mean, I'm come. I like the idea of five feet. It's hard to know on that on this plan. But, I mean, I think. Maybe Bill can um, clarify where that dashed line is. Um, that's kind of right behind the orange oval. That's the pool. I think it's the offset line. Is that about five feet away from where the shed is now? The back of the shed, Bill. Do you do you know? Uh, where my cursor is now is about six feet from no, the face Bill of the shed here. Where the uh, where the arrow to the shed is, there's like a dashed line just underneath the, the bushes. Right, right yeah. there. Yep. Uh, that is the that's the zoning setback line, but it's not for these accessory sheds. Okay, but I think Vanessa is saying just for uh, you know preservation of the the bank that we would like to have it set you know brought in to that line to have the shed in here no no to just bring it forward up to to the back of the shed oh, is down in that dash line i see i understand now um i i think that would be reasonable sandra do you have any comment hello hello hi yep. hello Hi. Um, so, what what does the what does the that's um, proposed to bring it forward five? 
Is that what we're saying? To bring it to this line would be five feet. I, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not looking at the, at the map, at the, the, at the plan that you're looking at. Um, but I mean, I, I did want to make a suggestion since, um, and I'm not sure who's, who's the one that's proposing it to be brought forward a little, and that's fine. I, but is it, could we consider doing, since the, since the shed is smaller than, um, what is allowable by what was being said a little bit earlier, since it's smaller than that size, um, can we bring it forward three feet instead of five feet? Only because part of the addition of the house is on that side. I'm just curious if that's something that could be considered. If not, then I guess the five, I would be amenable to that. Or you could consider putting it on the other side of the, the property where you're, you're not nearly, your addition is not as big, but on that same line. Oh, that doesn't make it, that doesn't work. So while we at the five feet, moving at five feet. It... I'm, I mean, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Right here, Sandra said she was comfortable with that, Bill. Uh, Sandra said she was hoping for three, and I just want to point out that as it stands, we're oh, proposed right now. There's only 15 feet in between the addition and the face of that shed. So, moving it five feet forward, now you're only 10 feet away from the outside of your your addition, your windows and such. So. You know, in this case, because the backyard is so small, feet really matter. So if we could settle on three feet instead of five, that would be better. You know, we're trying to work with the applicant and I think, I don't know, it seems like there's not a lot of give to get in the pool where they want it. Uh, the, the suggestion by Vanessa is very reasonable because of the nature of the bank to move it to five feet. I don't see the problem. Okay, then, then I'll, I'll agree to the five feet. Okay, good. Uh, Vanessa, does that, uh, that suit your, your motion? Yes. Okay, so the motion's been made to grant an order of conditions. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, uh, and we have all the conditions that we, we, we had uh, asked, right, Georgia? Yeah, the chlorine issue, uh, no, yes, uh, I'm sorry, uh, do we have the issue of uh, not discharging chlorinated water into the storm drain? Yes, we did. Yeah. Okay, uh, is there a second to the motion, please? I already seconded. Oh, you did? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, don't call the members. Hit yes or no, please. Uh, Vanessa? Yes. Michael? Yeah, because the board has, a, the majority has agreed to the waivers, then I feel I should uh, uh, go along with the project, especially when they're willing now to move the shed to five feet, so yes. Okay. Uh, Ann? Yes. And Chelsea? Yes. And Peter, yes. Okay, so you're all set, Bill and Sandra. Good luck. Thank you. And just be in touch with Georgia to, uh, to uh, you know, the inspections that she has to make as the project moves along. Correct. Okay, next up on our agenda is a notice of intent for 23 Congress Ave, DEP file number 14-13. So I guess there is no DEP finish number, is that correct, Georgia? Correct, one hasn't been received. Okay, yet. Um, so uh, we're only gonna be able to just uh, talk in generalities here. We won't be able to vote on anything this evening without a DEP uh, number. Uh, Georgia, do you wanna give us a, a quick two sentence overview and then we'll turn it over to Bob and Ryan and they can just uh, show us uh, their, their presentation? Um, of course, thank you. So for background on this project in particular, it's a little backwards in that we received the notice of intent filing, what we kind of call after the fact. Um, I did, there was, I 
like I had noted in the memo, a miscommunication with the building department um, in which they issued the building permit. And so the applicant went ahead and started building. When that was discovered by our department, um, we had asked Mr. Livermore to stop work, put up erosion controls, and file a notice of intent um, and hire a professional consultant to do a plan. So he has done that. The photos I provided in the memo show the work that has been done to date. Um, so mainly the photos you're seeing are one of the additions that the applicant is proposing. And I'm sure Bob can give more overview on the work that has been done, but there has been, um, I think, nine of the helical piles installed. Um, does that give some background or did the commission have any other questions? Anybody with questions, just uh, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll just turn it over to Mr. Griffin. No? Uh, okay, Mr. Griffin, uh, just uh, go ahead and uh, show us just what the project entails. Okay. Please. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna share my screen, and sometimes it works good, and sometimes I, I struggle with this, but we're going to try anyway. So you see the big blue box? Yes, we do. Oh, thank goodness. All right. This works about 70% of the time. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So um, Mr. S and Mr. Stasio and his wife live at 23 Congress Street. And I just got a couple of uh, sort of to get us on the Locust Street. Congress Street is sort of, you know, between the two Danversport driveways. So here's Elliott Street and there's the, the driveway going out to the Yacht Club here and the driveway going into the uh, function hall here. And here's Congress Street in the middle. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. So there's Mr. Can I interrupt uh, you for just one sec? Yeah. Bob? Okay. Bob, I'd like to interrupt for one second, please. Yes. Um, uh, you mentioned the name Stasio as the owners, and I'm yes. seeing that the Livermores are the owners. Yeah, Mr. Livermore is a um, is a contractor hired by the Stasio, so I, I, there's just a, a mix up, I think. Um, but okay. Mr. Good. Mrs. Thank you. Stasio own the property, uh, and and it's so this it's this number twenty three here, and so they have this sort of L shape or I don't know, it's not exactly a pork chop, but. Uh, dog leg, perhaps shaped lot here uh, for Congress Avenue. And then there's a paper street that runs next to their property here, uh, which I think is called uh, Broughton on some plans, but uh, Border Street, I'm sorry, Border Street is this paper street here. Uh, I'm gonna show you next the flood zone map of the property here. Uh, so this is the FEMA map and the dot is at the location of the, of the uh, 23 Congress Street. And you can see that there's an elevation 10 contour uh, that is sets the 100 year flood elevation. And that, um, as you'll see when I show my topographic plan, comes very close to the proposed uh, building addition in his uh, existing building. Um, here's uh, an aerial view of the property. This is uh, taken from Mass uh, DOT's uh, database. Here's the uh, Stasio residence here, uh, a little walkway, a driveway, and a garage. The garage is actually located on that paper street. Um, the building was built, we think, uh, approximately 1920. Uh, there was an, uh, the rear building addition was put on approximately 1960. Um, so it's it's been around for a while. It's certainly a, a pre-1997 lot. Uh, it is within the riverfront zone. And this is a view from the opposite direction. So here's, uh, this is um, often referred to, I think, as Millet Creek. But uh, uh, you go a short distance and you're in the Porter River. Here's the Stasio residence here with a, a small uh, deck off the back here and mostly salt marsh uh, between uh, the mean high water line here and the property. Um, so we did uh, we did a, a survey here and I'm going to this is our uh, site plan at uh, one inch equals 20 uh, and I'm going to zoom in because this is hard to see. Uh, but you can see here's the Stasio residence here this area that I'm circling with my uh, mouse. There's the garage, which is again in the, the uh, right of way uh, and the driveway is also in the uh, in the private way here. Um, so we, the Stasios are proposing two building additions. Uh, this one here is approximately uh, eight and a half by 14 feet and it's at the second story of the building. So the first story is underneath this. This is really a vertical uh, extension. There's might be a small little uh, extension in the rear, but there's no new foundation work required for the second story building addition here. Uh, on the right side of the building, which is the east side of the building, uh, this building addition is approximately 13 feet wide and approximately 32 feet long. And this is a one-story building addition. 
and it uh, is supported by uh, helical piles and the existing building. So, uh, and uh, George is right. There was there was a little mix up on the permitting uh, aspects here. The Stasios had to get zoning board approval for this project, which they got in August. They went to the the zoning board meeting. They got approved. Uh, the decision was filed. They waited the requisite number of days. The building permit application was uh, uh, was filed and then approved. And uh, so Mr. Livermore went out and installed the foundation uh, that we'll see in the pictures here uh, without realizing that this project had to wait for an order of condition. So that's why we're here. And it's just, a, just an honest mistake. Um, nobody's trying to get away with anything here. Um, so here's the, the crushed stone area with those helical piles you can see in a line here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Or take, I'm sorry. This is the uh, this is behind that crushed stone area. Here's another view of the crushed stone area. You can see the erosion controls have been installed uh, as uh, requested, and these little guys that are sticking up here are helical piles. So this is a a steel shaft, usually around two inches in diameter, or sometimes two inch by two inch square. Uh, there's some helical flights that are on these things, and they're just augered into the ground. Uh, and as it's augered in. <coughs> Uh, the machine can sense the resistance, and when it hits adequate resistance, uh, some shear pins in the driving mechanism uh, shear off, and it stops. And then that's where you basically cut the the pile off, and you put this cap on it. The cap will then receive some pressure treated wood, uh, which is the foundation of the building. So what you see here is is pretty much ready to go for carpentry. Um, the you know the the extent of earthwork that's required for this project uh, is not much, and it was completed. Uh, in that couple of days stretch when the building permit was active. Uh, you can see that there's um, some wires coming down into the building here. And, and this is, again, is a one story building addition. So we're gonna have to move those wires a little bit and move this downspout. But basically, you know, everything that happens for the for the addition uh, is all above grade at this point in time. Here's another view from the, uh, the riverside looking back towards the street uh, at the crushed stone area with the helical piles installed. Uh, so I'm going to bring the site plan back up. Uh, the wetland resources, uh, we have, uh, here's our mean high water line. Uh, we have a salt marsh in through here. And so we have a 25 foot uh, no disturb zone. That's this line right there. The 35 foot no build zone is right here. And so you can see all of the work is uh, outside the no build zone. Uh, the work is about 42 to 44 feet away from the uh, salt marsh line at its closest point. Um, the elevation 10 contour is this line right here. So as I mentioned, the building is you know, just outside the elevation 10 contour. So it's just outside the flood zone uh, in the land subject to coastal storm flowage. And then the 200 foot uh, outer riparian line. So is right here. So of course, all of this land is within the riverfront area. And I think when you look at the site plan, you, you know, it's pretty obvious that the building addition has been located as far from the river as possible. You can see we have this dashed line here is the zoning setback line. Uh, this uh, obviously was uh, is beyond the zoning setback line, but they got relief in order to construct that. And um, uh, given the constraints uh, posed by the existing house, by the narrow uh, shape of the lot, this was really the only location to put a building addition. It's a pretty modest addition. As I mentioned, it's only one story uh, and doesn't require a whole lot of earthwork because of these somewhat innovative uh, helical piles that were used. Uh, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm ready for questions. I can leave this site plan up or we can go back to the, uh, the Hollywood squares. Look, if you'd rather, whatever you prefer. Um, yeah, we can just leave that there. I okay. just have a quick question on why these piles instead of a, a typical foundation. Yeah, so, um, you know, helical piles probably weren't being used anywhere around here five years ago. Uh, I started seeing them in some, home, you know, some home building magazines. And, you know, you have a relatively lightly loaded structure here. Uh, again, one story, you know, 14 feet wide. So half of the weight goes on the existing house, half of the weight goes on the new line of piles. Um, it's just, it's a pretty light structure and it's a pretty uh, inexpensive way to get a foundation installed. The helical piles are frost resistant in that they're at least four feet down to the bottom of the piles. Uh, but you can see it's, it's a, you know, it's a way to get a structure in without a whole lot of earthwork and concrete work, obviously. Or post hole digging. Well, the post hole digger doesn't quite work in this. Remember, we have to auger the thing down and we have to, it has to engage in the soil, these helical flights. 
Uh, and once they've engaged enough and they're providing enough resistance, then this driving mechanism, the, the shear mechanism will actually shear. And then you'll know that you've gotten the, the uh, helical pile in deep enough and it's engaged with enough of the uh, on-site soils to provide the resistance uh, necessary to support the building. So it's it definitely, it's, it's not a post hole thing. It's probably, you know, if you're familiar with um, uh, like a case 580, you would have a, a backhoe uh, arm on the back of one of those things and you can uh, replace the bucket with the driving mechanism. It doesn't require a particularly large machine, but it, it does require you know a, a pretty good sized tractor uh, type excavator backhoe machine to put these things in. Sometimes I've also seen them go in with a bobcat machine. That's not a small bobcat, but perhaps a medium sized bobcat. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the only real question I have. I mean, it seems like you're you're in good shape as far as our our setback lines. Um, right. I really have no further questions. I'm going to turn it over to the other members. Uh, so let me start with Mike. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just had a question on uh, the the type of uh, supports, the helical supports. Uh, how far down do they go, and do you have to uh, come back and adjust for settling after that? Um, so I, I'll, I, I was not involved in actually driving these at this particular site, but I would tell you my experience is that generally these things go, you know, six to eight feet. I've had them go, you know, 12 to, to 20 feet actually. Um, and it's just, you just keep driving them down until they engage to this, to the adequate resistance. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the, uh, the shear, the driving mechanism shears off. And at that point, the backhoe gets removed from the shaft. And it, so what you do is you then cut the shaft at the at the proper elevation and you put that cap on it. The cap has the U shape that the um, that receives the uh, the pressure treated wood. So um, you know once 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 you've achieved adequate resistance, you just cut it off, slap the cap on, and you're done. Yeah, I was just curious. Was our building department familiar with this type of process? Uh, I don't know, uh, and I, I do know that Mr. Livermore, uh, the, the contractor that was involved in installing these things is online. Perhaps he could answer some of these questions. Uh, yeah, we did review them with Rich Maloney ahead of time prior to installing them, and he is aware of them. All right, and uh, he's in favor of them? Yep, he's, he's used them multiple times in the city, and he's aware of them. All the spec sheets were presented to him um, and installed as, as per Goliath Tech spec, so... Thank you. I, I, I know it doesn't really directly relate to this, but I'd never seen these before. So thank you for that. And, and the other place that you might see these things actually is um, uh, foundation repairs are often uh, repaired with a helical auger type of thing that's driven in next to the footing. And then the footing is jacked up and rests, it's rests on these helical piles. So it's a technology that has been around for basement repairs for a long time, but I think using them for decks and small additions is uh, something that seems to be happening just more recently. Again, to, to me anyways, in the last five years or so. Thank you, that's all I had. Okay, uh, Ian, any questions or comments? Um, I'm just wondering about the, uh, the construction itself in terms of uh, where materials will be kept and uh, will they be kept far enough away from the, um, our, 35, 25, et cetera, lines here in terms of once the construction starts for the, the additions here. Right, so right now there is a dumpster in the driveway uh, and it still provides adequate room for Mr. and Mrs. Stasio to park their cars off street. Um, and so I think the construction staging is gonna happen primarily in the front yard. Uh, we obviously have got some erosion controls set up in the backyard. We don't want any activities beyond the erosion controls. Uh, and I think it's a convenient location, you know, next to the driveway is relatively flat. They can um, uh, drop construction materials there and it's a short walk to the uh, building area from that point. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll say it again. Yep. All right, Chelsea. Sorry, my uh, computer froze. Um, no, I don't have any questions. I, th I think okay. I'm all set. Vanessa. Um, I just have one question. Um, Bob, could you go back to the photo right before the plan? Thank you. Um, I was just curious about all the crushed stone here because it seemed like the crushed stone was going in the area of the addition, but it also seems like it's 
beyond the erosion control and um, this, I just I'm just wondering why it's also in this front front area by the deck. So uh, Mr. Stasio told me that they used to have crushed stone in this area anyways, and I think it just got top dressed with the new crushed stone when the foundation work was happening, but there's no construction uh, proposed down in this particular area here. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't have anything else at this time. Okay. Um, that being said, are there any comments from the public? Uh, Dave? Mr. Chair, there's no email. Any phone calls, Alicia? No phone calls. Uh, okay, is there anyone listening in directly that would like to make a comment? Uh, hearing none, uh, like I said earlier, we do not have a DEP uh, file number for this, so we cannot, can't really issue an order of conditions. Uh, so uh, all we're gonna be able to do right now is to uh, continue to our 1210 meeting. Uh, okay. So if someone can make a motion to that effect, uh, we'll proceed from there. Before that, Mr. Chair, could I just uh, ask, uh, Vanessa brought up a point with the crushed stone. Um, does the applicant know, does the crushed stone extend uh, into the uh, area of no build and no disturb? Well, it, it looks like, um... I'm looking at the edge of the deck here. The, from that photograph, it looks like it goes a few feet beyond the edge of the deck. Here's the edge of the deck. And so if I go back to the site plan, you can see there's the deck there. And so it looks like it, the crushed stone might be going into the no build zone a little bit, but it's certainly not going into the no disturb zone. But I think we can get that uh, we can get that area raked up and neatened up uh, between now and December 10th. If that's that out of there? Yeah. That would be good. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, is someone willing to make a motion to uh, continue? I'll make a motion. Yeah, Fine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. I'll move we continue uh, the public hearing to our next scheduled meeting. I think it's December 10th, so that uh, we uh, by then the applicant should have a, a number, a DEP number. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay, uh, the both on this then, uh, Vanessa? Yes. Michael? Yes. Ann? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. And Peter? Yes. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you on 12-10. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay Thank healthy, you. and we'll see you all then. Okay, Thank you. Okay, great. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. Thanks, you too. Uh, next up is a notice of intent for 18 Congress Avenue and 11 Harvard Avenue. Not quite sure, but this has also been continued to December the 10th. Uh, next up is, I need a motion to open the public hearing uh, to discuss our wetlands uh, bylaw regulation updates. Do we have to close the last one? No, we just voted to continue it. Okay, all right. Well, what are we doing here? So now to discuss the regulations, we need to open a public hearing. Oh, I move that we open the public hearing for the wetland regulation updates. Okay, is there a second? I'll second the motion. I'll second okay. the motion. All right. So <laughs> with all the motions in the seconds, I think we're under the vote. <laughs> so, uh, yes or no, uh, Vanessa? This is a vote to open the hearing? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Michael? Yes. Uh, Ian? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Okay. And Peter? Yes. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm sure everyone's aware that the, uh, the vote passed the town meeting to uh, amend the uh, the wetlands bylaw. So now I guess the teeth of that uh, change is in the regulations, and that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Uh, with that brief overview, I'm going to turn it over to 
Georgia, and she could just uh, add it whatever else she feels is appropriate, and then we'll just we'll go from there. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Peter. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, just let me know what you guys can see. Keep it short. Can everyone see? Yeah. The screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, so like Peter had said, this I think this is our third conversation on the regs, but we've kind of been talking about talking about them as we've been talking about the bylaw updates. So Peter had said those bylaw um, was adopted on the 26th. There is um, a small wait period in which we have to wait for the attorney general to review that language and approve that. That average takes anywhere from about three weeks to 90 days. So um, once we get that official confirmation from the attorney general back, that's when the new bylaw will be implemented on projects that are submitted after that. So I just wanted to clarify for the commission um, where that stands. As for the regulations, again, that's the statutes that we adopt locally with just the commission doesn't need town meeting approval. Um, and the last big overhaul I think the commission did was in 03, and that's when they changed the fees. So there really hasn't been much updates to the regs since I think 1999 when they were um, adopted. So what we've reviewed so far, I've put up here, um, adding our additional performance standards, the Coastal docks and piers, our new buffer zones, um, as well as now protecting Vernal Pools, isolated wetlands. We've updated our definitions. We now have more in-depth waiver requirements um, and triggers that require alternative analysis. Um, and we've also added a waiver request form, which I'll show you in a little bit. And then just our general stuff has been updated to really reflect, you know, 2020 modern times, talking about electronic copies, how many copies, and that's in the filing procedures. So really the three kind of big points that we said at the last meeting that needed to be discussed was uh, the fee schedule changes, if anyone had a chance to look at those. And then that remainder, um, finding the inch requirement for floats, I had noted in the memo with staff is suggesting 18. That's what I would kind of put in there for now as a placeholder, but I think it would be good for the commission to make that final choice and vote on that um, when this is fully adopted. And then submission requirements, the appendix A and B, those are finalized um, and were included in your packet. So does anyone have any questions before? I was gonna jump in to just give a quick overview on the fee schedule changes. Just uh, a quick general question, Georgia. Will these uh, changes that we vote on tonight, uh, will the Attorney General rules on the bylaw change before they go into effect? Say that. Sorry, Peter, you broke up a little bit. Do you mind saying that one more time? Do these uh, regulation changes, do they have to wait for the Attorney General's approval of the bylaw change? Uh, no, I would say town meeting voted to approve that. And I would also say it's very unlikely the attorney general is going to have edits to that bylaw. Um, so it's in the best interest for the commission to adopt these, like we had said. Mm -hmm. um, probably we wanted by the 12th, but of course now we know we have a little bit more time and we did schedule that special hearing. So if there were edits to any of things tonight, that would give us a couple of days to update that and then have our full kind of finished, ready to go by the 19th. Okay. All right, so I was gonna jump into just overviewing these updated fee amounts that um, we've at, I added in the packet. Mm -hmm. Some members may have been here in 2016 when we, we talked about updating our uh, fees then and that nothing really came about of that. And I think this is a, perfect time to do it. These were the suggested fees um, David and I had kind of talked about really based on other towns. I put in um, a fee comparison chart, just mm -hmm. what we see from other towns. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Great. So if you guys saw this, you can really see where our new fee, those proposed numbers really came from. And again, we hadn't updated since I think the late 90s, 99 or early 2000. So a lot of these fees definitely needed to be um, updated. And I do want to note, in, in addition to changing the actual 
fee number. Um, we've also kind of explored different options for encouraging applicants to kind of have a complete process and a complete timeline. So in that you'll see our cert certificate of compliance, we were charging 50, we're finding the average now is about 100 and that seems appropriate. And we incentivize people here that if you were to come back before your permit expires and close it out, it's going to be 100. If you come back with an expired order to close out, you know, 10 years down the line, four years down the line, it's going to be $100 extra. So we've seen other towns do that. We hope it encourages people to follow the deadline on their applications and have our permits closed out. Similar to amendments, um, we've changed this. You know, it used to be every request was 100. So we've changed that now to every time you're requesting an amendment to your plan, it's going to be increased. And we hope in that that what you originally proposed really should be that final buttoned up product. So we want to prevent people from coming back and back and back and making changes. Any questions on the fee updates? Mike, you're muted. Yeah. There you go. I just had a question on uh, What's the relationship between the fee and the the purpose of it? Is is to cover certain expenses, or in other words, how do you arrive at the numbers other than seeing what other towns are doing? That's a great question, and I'll let David jump in too. But we had talked about you know the staff hours that are now dedicated to the permit review. I think that has definitely changed. So you can see the minor project permit. That's not something we had before. That's a new fee we had to make up. And we equated a hundred dollars. You know that seems appropriate with the added staff time we now have to do for permit review, site visits, um, and I think that can be applied to really every section in here. The amount of review that is required it seemed necessary for us to to update that. So it's somewhat tied into the expenses incurred in planning us uh, to recoup some of those costs. Yeah, David, yeah. do you agree with that? Sure. Yeah, um, I would agree with uh, what Georgia said. And additionally, too, yeah, it, it covers the costs. Um, and also, we're, we're doing a much more extensive field review, I think, than we have in the past, uh, particularly Georgia and um, the others in my department. And we're going to do that going forward as well. So, so I agree. Does that impact, uh, David, does that impact, uh, you know, we talk about in projects where we want the applicant to hire uh, an expert for us, um, that's not gonna be part of a fee schedule or anything or any limit on that? Uh, that's a great question. So it doesn't limit it. It doesn't put a cap on anything. Uh, we'd be doing the review at the staff level anyway. So this, this fee cost is like the minimal cost to cover us going out into the field, reviewing the plans, writing the analysis and drafting it up. Um, the peer review cost could be uh, something else entirely. And generally, we'd see that on larger projects, but it doesn't always have to be. But a lot of what we're seeing for peer review lately would have to do with stormwater coverage um, or very unique situations. So a as, you, as you know, Mr. Splane. All right, thank you. Yeah. That's all. all right. George, one quick question. Yes. I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. The after the fact filing, is that similar to the situation we just had where someone comes in and they've uh, they've done some work before they got their permits? I will I will say that one is a little bit different in that there was some work with the town already, but I, I would say an after the fact filing is you know a full blown, they've done full work, no stop. Um there is a little bit of interpretation to after the fact filings, but that's what that situation would be most likely. Yeah. So that would be like the one that we had on Route 1 that was like the... The dog park. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. If that work never filed a... Yes, that, that's a perfect example. Okay. And do you think twice the application fee is sufficient for that? I, I would think that it'd be even higher. Say that one more time. You thought... You do, do you think, think 500 is good or should be higher? Well, if it's just an, a regular notice of intent and... Uh, application is what? Um, I'm just looking for it here. Well, I guess it depends on the categories. I guess, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking that, you know, there's got to be a significant consequences for, for doing work without having the permission. 
You know what? Now that you bring that up, Peter, I think Dave and I had actually discussed this and had talked about being at a percentage of the what the notice of intent fees would be and multiplying that. Um, so after the fact, I think our previous one, apologies, hold on. Um, we could say 200% of the notice of intent fee. So what you're, if you were to file your notice of intent as originally you're supposed to, say that's 200 bucks, we would require $400. So we could double the project costs if that's something the commission feels is a little bit more restrictive than just a flat 500. And I would just, you know, forgive me for not asking this question sooner, but what are the different categories for the notice of intent? Yes. Um, I have them right here. I had a feeling that may come up. So usually what we do see is category one, that's work on a single family home. So that's adding an addition, a pool, a shed. That's our typical, you know, what we saw tonight. Both of those would be category one projects. Category two, that's going to be a full, you know, new construction of a home. Um, and then there's other court categories that fall in that. I'm going to read a little bit, you know, parking lots, um, driveway crossings for single family homes. So there are certain triggers for each category. Um, category three is when you get a little bit bigger, it's site preparation. So that would be for your much, much larger, larger projects, um, subdevelopments, road con road construction, hazardous cleanup, water supply development. And then category four, those are bridges, dredging, airport, tree clearing, hazardous oil. And then category five and six, those are based on linear square feet. Um, and David, I'm not sure if you have much experience with categories five. And Well, category five, it does note that's when you work on docks and piers. The category six is one I don't get, we don't get too often. I think that's when projects get much larger. Um, and it does require portions of delineations. David, do you have experience with category six? Pro I'm putting you on the dot here, but. No, it's okay to put me on the spot. I don't have any experience with category six. That sounds yeah. like worst case where, hurricane. hurricane. <laughs> where would something like uh, the Whipple Hill project, where would that be? Um, so they, I would have to, depending on how they did so it would probably be category three which is road a new road construction and then each individual house would be a category two okay all right it makes sense yeah. okay good okay. yeah i have another question on yeah. the category five what is the linear foot i mean what are we measuring when we talk about the linear foot versus say a square footage uh formula that's a good question. So it sounds like a lot of the categories that fall into this are mainly linear, linear projects. So the docks and piers, those are going to have no. more linear. I mean, they are going to have square footage, but it, it goes by linear foot. That's how the DEP measures it. Did that answer your question, Mike? What? Like roads as, roads as well? Well, so no. So that the linear foot when we charge by linear foot, that only knocks in when you get to category five. And a lot of those projects are really only, like it says here, docks, piers, and dikes, coastal or inland. Oh. That's where they're more concerned with linear impact as opposed to square footage impact. Thank you. All right. Anyone else on the fees? Yeah, I was just going to mention yeah. between the amendment after the fact and the after the fact filing like you said for category one if it's a hundred dollars oh, that if you amended it after the fact it's a five hundred dollar charge but if you never filed to begin with then it's only 200 so i think maybe getting those more in line with each other yeah david and i uh, we can work on updating those numbers and we'll have um i'll send that out with the updates we have tonight so you guys can review that. Great. Okay. This is Matt. Can I jump in and ask a question before you move on? Is that okay with you, Mr. Chair? I just want to make sure. Certainly, go ahead. All right, Matt. So it sounds like you did a lot of work on this. Is, are these fees, uh, I, I, I don't know how much they've increased. I think uh, probably not, not too much. I, I don't see the fees in the existing uh, bylaws, but. Here, Matt, um, I can pull them up for you. 
I apologize for not doing a comparison side by side. No, that's all right. My question is, uh, did you uh, reach out to the nearby towns to see what their fees are? are? Are we kind of in the same ballpark as what other towns are charging? So that's a great question, Matt, and I can pull the, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. So this shows, um, again, this is not that recent, I would say within the past two to three years. So I can pulled all the fees from the other towns and did a just a comparison. So on average, Danvers is under when we compare to Beverly, North Andover, Manchester, Reading. Our fees were really, in some cases we matched other towns, but there were definitely options where we were way under what we could be requiring, what we see required. Um, I don't know if you can see that, Matt. Yeah, I can see that. That's That's kind of what I was asking. Because we want, is the purpose of these fees to kind of cover our costs in term, terms of man hours? Because uh, some of these projects, you know, that, you know, they, they uh, profit wise, it's like in the millions of dollars sometimes. So why should we give away our time? Uh, it's basically, you know, the taxpayers are subsidizing. Uh, what's required of the developer or the applicant. So we want to see kind of not make it profit driven, sort of like the way the building uh, the code administration is permits. We don't need to go that far, but we should at least try to cover our costs, um, you know, and get our, you know, get our fair share of, uh, of, of um, what it costs to, to uh, um, provide this service. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So I think on the fees, we got the feedback we needed on the fees. So everyone will see in the packet, I actually just added this today. I've compiled all, um, we had section by section listed in the memo packet. So I've compiled it all, added um, a cover page, I would say accept any comments the commission has um, of any review you guys do before the 19th. The bylaws really, I mean, the regulations are really at 90%. I think there's there's definitely some formatting I need to do. I know I have some spacing and um, periods and commas that need to be added, but um, I would suggest that the commission's more than welcome to use this as the guiding master final document. Um, if you did want to print it out, sit down and review, or just look at a couple sections. Um, so the second portion I had on my list was for the commission mm -hmm. to talk about the 18 inches um, that we have in section four for our additional resource areas protected under the bylaw or supplemental performance standard. Um, so I know we've talked about a little bit at each meeting, we've had these discussions and I think we've talked about it a lot um, as each project comes up. So before the commission, before we finalize the regulations, I think it'd be good for the commission to discuss and, and determine a number that they felt comfortable with. Um, you, mean, you mean doing that tonight or? Well, I will say it would be good to be tonight if you guys want to have that discussion or at least it should be determined before the 19th if the commission's going to be looking to you know, adopt those regulations at the next special meeting. This is the minimum of the, we had a regulation when, when you had originally, we were looking at a lot of these peers and you sent around uh, some proposed standards and the 18 was the minimum of, uh, I forget it was like 18 to 36 perhaps. So. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the coastal coastal regs. And uh, uh, how did we get back to the minimum? That's a great question, Mike. Um, can, I, can I just make a comment uh, for you there, Georgia? Okay. Just uh, Mike, in her verbiage there, that paragraph at the bottom, uh, we were thinking that the 18 inches would be the minimum for a float, irregardless if it's a uh, a clam habitat or not. Uh, then, you know, what we had before, the two inches we went before, we were over clam habitat, and I think that's what we voted on the 22 inch. Is that, did I paraphrase for you sufficiently, Georgia? 
A little bit. I think so. And I, and I see what Mike is saying. Cause you know, the last discussion we had said 18 to 22 and Peter, you had just noted that, you know, we have the 18 implementing that, that bottom number 18 would apply to every peer in float project, regardless of shellfish or not. And I think, and that's always been the standard the commission has required. And it's usually what we put in the order. And once we do that, that's really the last time we see from the applicant. And so we don't have sufficient evidence, one, that people can realistically achieve 18. And we haven't had in the past any mechanisms to make them do it. You know, a lot of the times we hear, well, the mud's so high, it's not going to work. Well, um, so in this instance, <clears throat> we believe if we require the 18, but then also put in the inspection requirements and proof that 18 inches is met and it's maintained, if we can see that from applicants over time, then down the line, the commission can adopt something higher and because we know that it can be achieved. And I also wanted to note, um, the commission had asked me to reach out to Department of Marine Fisheries about, you know, the number, why they pick 18, why is it higher over shellfish and she really, Tay had said, you know, there really, there's not a magic number. There's not a number that's better than another. Of course, I think higher is better, but it's also in terms of being realistic in the in environment that we do have in the rivers of Danvers. Um, I think it would be a really great feat if we could have all our future docks hold anything above low tide and hold it strong and have it maintained for a couple of years and having that continually inspected. Um, and I'd also noted that keeping 18 with the option to change it in the future after DMF issues, it sounds like they're working on a small docks and pier guideline. We actually, we have one from the DEP that we've had for years, I think since early 2005, 2008. But this is exciting in that Department of Marine Fisheries is putting out their own. And in that, there's going to be a lot more performance standards for shellfish habitat, land underwater ways. And I think with that, that will give the commission more standing and, and I think data support to support a higher number. I know I, I kind of just spieled a lot, but it was really to sum up what Tay had said and really what staff was thinking as to why, I don't think it's a bad thing to looking at it like we're ver reverting back to a lower number. I think it's now we're really gonna implement the number we've been requiring and regulate it better with our standards. Whew, did that make sense? <laughs> I apologize. You should have just stuck with my two sentences, Georgia. I really should, because I, I really want I it's a I want to give you too much information, but sometimes that can be harmful. So any thoughts from the commission on that? Well you got mine earlier. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're more than welcome to share those. I think that that's great. Well, I liked it. I mean, I think having a um, 18 inch minimum is good. When you just when you drive around the, the waterfront at low tide and see all of these docks just sitting on the mud, you know, we can just get some kind of standard. We're going to say this is the minimum, folks. You got to adhere to that. And if if we want to go higher over the uh, the clam flats, uh, you know, let's go for it. But uh, you know, just we, we have to establish a standard somewhere. And, you know, I think we have some uh, backup with the, the state people on the 18 inches. So that's um, my are, two cents. Okay, Peter, are you suggesting that that the <clears throat> people who are established with their peers and not coming before us should be um, monitored for 18 inches? Is that what the idea is? I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't see part of it because I get locked up. But I, okay. I, I think what I'm saying is that, you know, any project that comes to us now, a float cannot be lower than 18 inches above the mud at low tide, period. Well, I haven't been on this commission very long, but we haven't had anything that we had let go at eight, below 18. Right. Um, but, so but so do we saying, have people out there that are below 18? Is that what you're saying? Oh, and take a, take a ride down through Danversport at low tide. You would see so many floats just sitting on the mud. Um, you know, we permitted someone on Riverside earlier this year when you, I know you were part of the board and uh, the boat, right, the, the, the house next door, the boat tied up to the dock at low tide is sitting right on the mud. So what do we do about those people? 
So that, I mean, up. that's what I'm saying. It's like, okay, if yeah. you have the 18 inch standard, are we going to enforce it? Or is that our responsibility? Or is that the planning departments? Yes. So that's a great <laughs> question. I will say, well, the department in general, we're doing a long term overhaul to really inspect our waterfront and really take a good look at every lot, every pier, dock, float, what has a permit, what doesn't. As you can imagine, that's going to take a very long time. But on a case by case basis, to address the, the floats that are on the mud right now, I would say majority of those, the ones that do have chapter, active chapter 91 license and order of conditions, you know, they've built them as they should into plan. But a lot of the times those orders say you need to maintain an 18 inches. Right. So they were required to do it, but short of us, you know, going out to each one, sending letters, which are efforts we've tried to do in the past. And when now with these new implement these new implementation strategies we can do for inspections of course that this right here can't remedy all the past issues we have right now on the mud but this is going to prevent for the future like peter said but we're also going to be able to see how the corrective action works you know if we require in 18 inches as strictly as we're going to under these regulations it's going to have to be achieved and if we can see applicants doing that and we know it can be done now we have examples for those violators to look to and say, hey, we know it works. This is how they did it. They used helical anchors. They used pier pilings. It's the, you know, now that we'll have evidence to point to, I think this will definitely help the violation efforts in the future. Okay. Now, you all, there's also um, an indication from the state anyway that we could have the opportunity to raise that from 18 inches. But that puts us into that fuzzy area where people are saying, well, you say 18 inches, and they think that's what they should do. Well, we went to the 22, and um, Tibbet Street said, okay, no no problem, went ahead and did it. So I think, you know, I, from what we've just done and moving now, we f it does feel like we're going backwards if we've been having these last couple of meetings where we've put done the 22. Well, um, I feel like 18, I think there's kind of a distinction here to be made, which is um, 18 is kind of what we've been asking for when it's not shellfish habitat. Okay. And then we've been considering more when it is shellfish habitat. So I think the ones that we've asked for more, because... I mean, DMF did give guidance of 30 inches, which right. most people have said that's not feasible. Like the, the mud is too sinky. It gets, is that a word, sinky? Um, <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired. Um, that it just, it, there's been, people have said it's on, it's too much of a gap. It's unsafe, but I don't know why they're even out there if it's that muddy anyways. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I don't know why you would have to make a 30 inch step up at low tide because you'd be sunk in the mud. So anyways, <laughs> I think that's one of two things that one is when you're not in shellfish habitat, okay. I think the 18 is what we're asking for. And then the question I think is when we are in shellfish habitat, do we want to have this, the discussion every time or do we want to just put a number in here that then we don't have to have the discussion every time and we can just say this is what's in our Right. Well, see, that would make more sense to me if we're doing 22 for shellfish that we write it down and say it. Um, because I, I, of course, I only came in for these 22 inch discussions. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they, they were all. I think. I think every time we had the discussion, it was all shellfish. Habitat. Shellfish. Okay. Yeah. So I think that makes sense to me. But to write it out because everyone's looking at the 18 inches. Yeah, and I think. That is like that's definitely ap applicable when there is not when it's not shellfish habitat. Yeah. Okay. Because there are still plenty of those as well. Okay. That makes more. That makes sense to me. So from what I'm kind of hearing is that 18 inches non shellfish habitat subject to the inspection requirements, and then 22 inches over shellfish habitat mm -hmm. subject to the inspection requirements. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That sounds all about 22. It's just so like arbitrary. I don't know. It drives me kind of nuts. I know it's kind of what we landed on. And 
Um, I, I don't feel like we're going to get 30. I feel like every time they're not, nobody's going to commit to doing that, which I can, I can kind of understand. And then I feel like 24 at least has more of a basis that we could justify by saying it's like halfway between 18 and 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because um, yeah, at some point we might be have to go to 30. Yeah. And well, you know, if there obviously are situational issues with, you know, it's not like there's probably other towns that people are putting these docks over sand or over rocks and ours is just yeah. Yeah. mud, mud and mud, mud. So, uh, but I, I, I know we've come up with 22 because that's kind of what we were able to get out of people. But when we're co like writing this down and making it permanent, codifying it, it's just, it's just super arbitrary to me. But it makes more sense to have a differentiation between plain old mud and shellfish habitat. I think so, in my opinion. Mark, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I agree. Originally, I know we had settled on 22. I was looking for 24 before, and uh, which was sort of the mid midpoint. Yeah. Uh, between the 18 and the 30, and uh, somehow we ended up with 22. The, if, the, the, before we fifteen as the minimum, I'd be okay with that. Okay, uh, Chelsea, anything to add? Uh, oh, uh, is there language in there? That... Go ahead, Mike. Um, Go ahead. I've got nothing. I'm just kind of like we kind of already discussed this the uh, whole like eighteen inch yeah. thing. Um, I'm content with it, honestly. Because, yeah, the more I thought about it, like, no one's able to reach. The, I don't think we've ever seen anyone meet, meet the 30-inch uh, thing. So I feel like, like, are we proposing, like, the 22-inch for, like, identified shellfish habitat? Or is it just 18 inches no matter what? No, the 22 inches for shellfish habitat to distinguish the two. Okay. I, I'm in favor of that. I like that. I think that's the best we're ever going to get is 22 inches anyway, since our riverbed is so, like, muddy. Right. Um, yeah, magically, it's changing before our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to be devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. we are approached for what is our justification oh, on for, you. for 22 what what is our justification for twenty two? We heard from the clams. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, what's it? What? We got that info from the fisheries. That email that Georgia got that they were doing a study on what the impact is, and like something interrupted them, so they weren't able to complete it. But like, I feel like thirty inches is what we kept getting from the fisheries every time it yeah. came up. Yeah. Um, but no one can reach thirty inches here, so twenty two is. It seems like the best we can do, and I don't know why it landed on 22 and not like 25 or 20, but um, at the very least, that's how I justified it. it. It was the closest we could get to 30 without plummeting into like 15, 10. Yeah, I kind of feel like maybe my recollection is off, but I feel like we were trying to go for that halfway point because between like halfway between 18 and 30 is 24 but i feel like we were like it was kind of a negotiation back and forth and 22 was all we could get out of people and then once we got it once we just kind of kept going with it right that's exactly that was my right. recollection too yeah yeah but um, you know what's the rationale to to say well that four inches what's the rational connection between the extra four inches and shellfish I mean, how do you make it four? Why isn't it six? Does it have to do with the size of the shellfish, the way they gather? Or, uh... Well, I think what DMF so what... said was the the higher you can get, the better. But they're they're not giving us at this time the reason the justification that we were kind of because they you know they've been recommending thirty, but then we didn't really. When you asked the question again, we didn't really get that. So. I think, I mean, I guess theoretically we could say that for 22, well, it's more than 18 and more is better. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair? It's mm -hmm. off the mud. Uh, go ahead, Dave. 
sorry, uh, I do like where this discussion is going. I, I'm just thinking to to come to a well, this is all peaceful, but a peaceful resolution. Um, <laughs> instead of putting a, a significant number on it right now, since DMF is still studying this, we could put in the regulations. It's 18 inches subject to an increase or discretion of the commission based on shellfish habitat, based on the study of shellfish habitat. And then in the meantime, wait to see what DMF comes up with. I, I don't think that's the direction you were heading, but again, Vanessa's point is well taken in that if asked, what what would the justification be for the 22 or 24 or any, any other number basically between 18 and higher? So j just a thought. Right, you based on the uh, commission's discretion. You, I would think you know, just 18 inches minimum, and we could we uh, withhold the right to uh, to increase that if we if we felt it was appropriate. That that's sort of where I'm going. So you know, if the shellfish habitat is clear and it's established that there is shellfish habitat, the commission could ask the applicant to investigate how high can you possibly get it. You know, given your current situation, because we know different lots in different locations are situational for the time being until DMF gets back to us. Okay. No, that sounds good. I, my only comment on that is I, I, I definitely feel more comfortable putting in a number that has some backing, but my only concern is what if it takes them five years and then we have to have the conversation 35 times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which we've already had it several. And I mean, that's okay. I just, you know, I think people want a number. And, but then if it's like a big hassle to update these later and we're not going to be able to, well, I guess we'd have to either way. If they come up right. with a number, we'd have to put in the you know, new number, but maybe it's not that easy. But um, it won't be as painful of going from 18 to 26, you know. Yeah. It, it's not a hassle to update the re the regulations either, too. So if, if we want to go with the number now, that's fine. Um, you know, we can update these at any other scheduled public hearing. So I guess it's just I'd like to go. Possible. I'd like to go with 24 because that's sort of what we wanted before the yeah. midway yeah. range. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if we don't put any number in some way, in some way, it's well, I don't know. I don't want to say arbitrary, but. It appears arbitrary. Um, we're like picking twenty four. We're we're taking into consideration the uh, the rec the recommendation between eighteen and thirty, and I think we're mm -hmm. being uh, reasonable. You know, picking in the mid range. Do, do you think the eighteen is the minimum? Do you think then that it should be twenty four, uh, and then if you're at, if the applicant is asking to go below, they need to demonstrate why. Is that? Sort of well, the only the only reasonable demonstration would be it's impossible. I right. can't that, do it. No, I know that. I guess that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. They'd, <laughs> they'd they'd physically have to show on a plan that for some reason it would be impossible to do. But, um, can I just uh, exert my chairmanship influence here? Can we just leave it at 18 inches for non-shellfish habitat? And we'll let's just. Let's just up. I, I agree with you, Mike. Let's go to 24 inches for something over the shellfish habitat, and just That's put that on that too. Okay. Okay. And yeah. it, you know, if we find down the road that we need to change it, like Dave just said, it's not that big a deal to change it. But that way, we have a hard and fast number that we're all pretty much comfortable with, and we we still have that 18 inches minimum where it's got to be off in the mud, which is where I really want to come from. Okay, I I'll go with 24. I like that. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. Vanessa, you comfortable with that? Yeah, that, that works for me. I feel like it's, mm -hmm. I can, I think the number is a little, has a little more basis to it, saying we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're halfway between, like, not being in shellfish habitat and what DMF is asking for that people are saying it's not practical, so we're going right. to go halfway between. Okay, good. Chelsea, you okay with all that? Yeah, that all sounds fine. All right, I find myself raising my voice because I don't see Chelsea's name on my body. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, okay. okay. So I will work to um, update this section, and then I'll send that out. To the, I'll send that out to the uh, commission before the weekend. I'll send this whole okay. um, big packet out so you guys particularly can read through that and make sure 
it's what the commission wanted. Um, and then the last portion I just wanted to, sorry if I'm making you dizzy. So our two appendices are originally our regulations, um, the plan and application requirements were <clears throat> folded into the regulation language. Uh, it was great. It, it definitely needed some updating. It also required the applicant to give us like 15 copies of everything, which I no longer want. There's so much paper. So, so we now just want two plans and a lot of electronic things. But so now our submittal requirements are in our appendices. Again, these can be changed um, at a meeting if we need to. And really what we require is standard, but I did have some interesting things. I think the commission would be happy to see and kind of wanted to get your thoughts. So for our plan requirements, I've kind of, I've been noticing, and it's not uncommon in that, of course, there's different consultants and engineers that present plans, but it would be nice to see some consistency among plans. You know, tonight we had even said, what's that blue line or what's that line marking? What does that indicate? So what I've seen in other towns do is requiring a certain color for a certain thing on the plan. Mm -hmm. um, not for all the plans, it would, mainly I'm hoping it would be the presentation plan. So every plan we would get from consultant A, all the plans would have the buffer lines highlighted in green, the no disturbs in red. So that was one thing we updated on the requirements that now all our plans will have that consistency. We're hoping that would, of course, make review a bit easier for the commission members and for staff. Hooray. Yes. <laughs> uh, I had a hard time looking at some of these. Oh, yes. Yeah. I So do I. <laughs> George, you've heard me say this before, and, and if and when we ever get back to in-person meetings, instead of having the, the, the applicant or their consultant get up, you know, put their drawing on an easel that none of us can really see. Yes. If, <laughs> if, uh, if we could somehow... Uh, I don't want to use the word force, but try to influence these people to give us something that we could display and project yes. up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Alicia and I and David, we actually tried to do that right before COVID. We were talking about that. So when and if we do go back to in-person, that will be the first thing. Because okay. we're used to yeah. having it so close in front of us now. So I'll make yeah. sure. Yeah, it's nice now. We're still just looking. I'm, I mean, I just have a, a laptop computer here, so it's not very it's not a very big screen. No. But, you know, just as I said, when we get back into a meeting room, it'd be nice if we could just see it projected up on a screen instead of just, you know, on that little easel. Yeah. Well, and I actually, I could note that, you know, consultants should be prepared to provide a presentation on a bigger screen and to provide a thumb drive, come prepared. We can add that note. Okay. That'd be, yeah, awesome. that'd be good, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Are, are you all set now, Georgia? Yeah. Sorry. Just taking that note. So, like okay. I said, this. Uh, Georgia, I would, I would just add that we wouldn't want to be doing that for a small project with a homeowner to have them to come in with uh, fancy electronics and all that, you know. Oh, yeah. No, no. Usually you know, those well, make sure. Mike, I think it's fairly simple to just to take a, an image, make it a PDF, and you can display the PDF up on a, on a projector. Right. Right. We mm -hmm. have the projector, so we'll we would be doing the okay. Yeah, but that is a good point. We'll make right. sure it's easy for the the homeowner. Um. All right. Well, I think we did some great work, guys. Thank you for all the feedback. That was awesome. So I'm gonna send over our 32 pages of regulations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's definitely some boiler stuff in here and, and again I kind of have to update the index but I'll make those edits that we had tonight I'll forward that to the board before the weekend and then our special meeting on the next Thursday on the 19th will be seven o'clock we'll open it like our similar hearings and this will be the only discussion we'll have so I don't envision it being too long but in the meantime if you're reading over the regs and you see something that you have a comment on or a question or an edit um Email me anytime, David or Peter or I, throughout the week, and we'll um, update those and send them out. Okay. I don't know about what everyone else's okay. plans are, but my plan is once you send that, Georgia, I'm going to run over to Staples and probably spend about $10. Oh, no. Well, 
I'm happy to also print it and uh, drop it off. If that, if you want to shoot me an email, I'm happy to do that for any members. Yeah, that person, I, I'd prefer to have a hard copy just because yeah. it's easier to go through. I'm the same. Uh, if you, you can print tomorrow. it off, yeah, that'd be even better. Anyone else while I have you on the horn, as my mom says? I always print out whatever, so I'm okay. I'm good. Okay. I'm good, yeah. All right. I'm, I've already printed out. Mike did his homework. He's got his. Yeah. Yeah, but now, now you're going to have changes, so you're going to print it all over. Yep. Well, the whole thing? <laughs> yeah. No, not George, the whole thing. Just for a little clarification here, yes. so next week we'll just be voting on this one item, this, this packet of regulations. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and whatever changes we want to make that night, we would just have to, uh, you know, make handwritten notes for ourselves, and you could you know, change it as as you go along. Yes, and I would hope, hopefully, we can get. There's no big changes on the last hour. I think we've covered a lot of big things. Um, we do have a lot of attentive m members that are really good with grammar. So if you do notice any of those, I'm happy to take those <laughs> willingly. Um, but I will also be reviewing it for all of that. So okay, good. Okay. I All right. So I guess we do we continue this hearing? Yeah. So if you want to make a motion to continue to the 19th. Well, let me just say, uh, I think we have to, before we do that, I just want to see if there's any public comment. So uh, Dave, has anyone emailed in on this? No emails on this item. All right. Any phone calls, Alicia? No phone calls. Uh, anyone else listening in that feel yep, like man. they need to make a comment? Yep, Matthew Duggan here, town meeting member, precinct one. Uh, was uh, will this uh, new hard copy be uh, on your website, on the planning department website, or on under concom that I can get prior to the meeting? Yeah. So once we have it adopted, Matt, we'll have it up on the website. But I'm happy to send you the draft um, copy yeah. we have now. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So I'll send that to you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Sounds. Or yeah, not or Monday, whenever. Okay. Fine. Great, and thank you. George, right, you probably should make it available if any any citizen requests it to uh, to be able to send them a copy. Yeah, so we I do want to know, we did put in the legal ad that copies were available or anyone could email with questions, comments, inquiries. We didn't get any, um, but once it is adopted, we'll have the full new adopted bylaw and regs on the website. Okay. All right, good. All right, so I guess uh, we need a motion to continue this hearing to our next meeting on the 19th. I make a motion that we continue this hearing on the regulations to the 19th of November. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a I'll second? I'll second that motion. Okay. I second. Uh, just, members, I'll, yeah, I'll ask you to vote yes or no. Vanessa? Yes. Michael? Yes. Anne? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. And Peter, yes. Okay, on to our next issue. Uh, I'm sorry, agenda item is minutes. And uh, from what I saw, there were no minutes for October 22nd on our SharePoint. So, right. Uh, that being said, I'll move on to is there any old or new business we need to discuss? No. Nope. Okay, good. All right. Uh, I entertain a motion for adjournment, please. I make a motion to adjourn this meeting of the okay. Con Conservation Commission. Second. All in favor? Vanessa? Yes. Michael? Aye. Anne? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. And Peter? Yes. Okay. Good job tonight, everybody.